India is a land of dreams, where images, however fleeting, are remembered long after the journey's end. The railway is her lifeline, crossing not only distances, but bridging the boundaries of her many cultures. For over 900 million people, the railway has become a great unifier. Over one and a half million must work to keep it going. is the lives of everyone. For nothing is more a part of this country than the trains which are part of its soul. Over a century ago, the sound of the steam locomotive could be heard across the land as it rolled through the desert and the plains of India. In those days, villages and cities were isolated by vast distances, and the coming of the train would change them forever. Legends were told of the great fire eater that walked on lines of steel and breathed white clouds of smoke. Those who did not fear it came to see it for themselves. In remote outposts where there were no stations, banyan trees often marked the train stop, and people anticipated its arrival like the coming of a great ship. There was always entertainment to greet the travelers, celebrating the trip for the magical event that it was. What had taken weeks by bullock cart could now be made in a matter of days. The hero was the driver. He was assigned one engine for life and cared for it as though it were a part of him, making sure it was fed coal and watered. It was like a living creature preparing for the long journey ahead. If there ever was a heart and soul of the railway, it began here with these locomotives. They were the symbol of the British Empire and held the romance of an age when men and machines united the country for the first time. But this era couldn't last forever. Now, the super-fast express trains command the rails and are moving India into a new century.
The railway is a living legacy of the British, who dominated the subcontinent for nearly 200 years. They laid down the first rails in 1850, and by Indian independence, dozens of railways reached across hundreds of princely states and territories. Today, all have been merged into one, stretching nearly 40,000 miles and connecting over 7,000 stations it is the largest railway under a single management in the world. Frontier Mail, the Tamil Nadu Express, the Punjab Mail, all long distance trains renowned in history. But one of the oldest is the Grand Trunk Express and it travels nearly the length of the country. Indians love to travel, whether it be on a religious pilgrimage or to visit relatives far away. They pack everything and bring everyone. They can go anywhere in the country for less than $7. Space has a whole different meaning on an Indian train. People like to sit next to each other, talk and share stories. And a stranger isn't a stranger for long. More than 11,000 trains travel through India every day, but it's in the three-tier second-class coaches that the real spirit of the country can be found. If anyone wants to know what India is all about, you could just travel in one of these trains and you could talk to people, you see. You'll actually meet people from uh, different parts of the country and you can actually uh, have a, uh, a look into the various cultures, you see. Now that's a cultural diversity in India. You can ac actually enjoy this cultural diversity, traveling in such long trains, say, from, which goes from one end of the nation to the another. other end. So such long trains you can enjoy. If you're really interested, definitely you'll experience it. Every Indian train has ticketless passengers who are part of its character. Gypsies, beggars, and sweeper boys who make their living earning tips between stations. I meet every type of people here. Maybe they are millionaires, they are uh, the poorest. They are engineers, doctors, bankers, every type of persons I am meeting. And when I travel, I, talk, I have an opportunity to talk to them, make friendship with them. We sometimes come closer to them and we become family friends for life. For centuries, explorers have been drawn to the east. In the 1660s, the British took possession of the strand of islands that curved into the Arabian Sea. They would make them the great port city of Bombay. Their gateway of India still stands as a memory of their empire's former glory. Bombay is now one of India's fastest growing cities. And the British presence seems unchanged at Victoria Terminus. Opened in 1888, it was built on the site of the first railway station. But now, it's the headquarters of Central, the busiest of nine zones in the Indian Railway. From this historic place, one of the most important men in the railway oversees his domain. This is the seat of power of the general manager. Problem between Kiratgarh and Kesla. There was a disaster. Every morning, 
The reigns for Vishnu calls upon his officers to account for every detail in a monumental system. From major accidents to minor delays, nothing escapes his attention. As many as eight trains, they have all been fired. It was from this same office that the British ran their railway. And with independence in 1947, they turned it over to Indian leadership. All right. Hello, Jabalpur. But now the GM controls a far more complex network. With 200,000 men beneath him, he runs 2,000 trains a day. Hi, Madan. Ah, Madan. Namaskar. What is happening today? What are your prospects of loading? Sir, uh, yesterday we did 8.5. Ajay, you just speak to CME. Your diesel utilization has slumped. Your diesel utilization has slumped. Your, uh, your sick wagon balances and all the yards are heavy. The stable loads are heavy. Just speak to CME. Hello. Hello, Madan. Ah, yes, sir. Ah, Lal Bol Rao. Katni Shed. Ah. For the last 15 days, it has been having very high failure rate. Uh -huh. Vishnu is more than a figurehead. If something goes wrong, he shoulders the full responsibility. And every month, he makes it a point to leave his office and visit his men in the field. Give your guidance. Okay. Like a present day Maharaja, Vishnu holds court in his private inspection coach. With full kitchen staff in attendance and all the ceremonies inherited from his predecessors. The Indian railways constitute the lifeline of India. And they gave, it was given to us by the British. They gave us two things. The Indian railways and a very powerful administrative system run by the bureaucrats. We were now going on an inspection trip, and during this inspection trip, we, we proposed to go over the entire railway lines, see what uh, management techniques are there, see how the cabins, the points, and uh, the people who, who manage these points look after themselves and look after the equipment. Each one has his area of responsibility and uh, a super check has to be exercised. So when we go out tonight, our objective is to find out what deficiencies are there and take measures to overcome them. No single person can possibly check on everything. The system depends on workers whose dedication goes largely unseen. Under the eyes of the cabin men, tens of thousands of coaches transport more than 12 million people a day. And one mistake can cost thousands of lives. For this is a human railway, where the strength of a lever man means the safe passage of a train. It is the largest employer in the world Officially, 1.6 million work for the railway. But Vishnu estimates that nearly 80 million people depend on it for their livelihood. The Grand Trunk Express continues southbound. The trip from New Delhi to Madras will last 38 hours. But for many, the journey is an adventure, and it doesn't matter how long it takes. Long distance trains have become temporary homes for village India. And those on board are captive audiences for ticketless travelers who earn their keep, providing everything from entertainment to food. On a train, meals are a big event, and passengers are constantly being solicited with different kinds of fare. Uh, 
12 bearers run the length of 22 coaches, waiting on as many as 2,000 people. They serve up to 400 hot railway meals twice a day. In the pantry car, cooks prepare food to suit the religious mandates of an Indian train, non-veg or vegetarian, for Muslims, Hindus, Christians. The hardest job may be in trying to satisfy the tastes of so many, and tastes do change from north to south. The food is, uh, uh, for, uh, for a man, it is very sufficient. It is, uh, we can comfortably, it's, uh, yes, it's more than sufficient for uh, one person. It is given to us, because uh, here you have the rice and then uh, dal, we call it the grams, and then vegetables also is available. Then it is a, it is a full meal for us. If there is a spirit of the railway, it is found in the thousands of small stations which have become part of the fabric of Indian life. They are centers where everyone gathers, and those who can't afford to travel will come just to watch the trains. The most impressive arrivals have always been the broad gauge steam locomotives, lovingly called the Black Beauties. They ride on the widest rails and their wheels stand taller than a man. But their presence is now becoming rare and those who grew up with them will miss them the most. Black is beautiful. Our steam locos are our black beauties. We feel with the phasing out of steam locos as if we are doing away with one of our kith and kin with whom we had blood relations. throughout Eastern Railway, loco sheds are busy preparing their engines for a black beauty contest. It is a competition like no other. Only the best engines are entered, and to win the black beauty is the highest honor a shed could have. Dunbad, Rampurhat, Sahib Ganj, Asunso, Jaja. Five sheds hurry to add the finishing touches, transforming these workhorses into the beauties that they really are. This possibly should be the very last black beauty contest of Indian Railways. We meant to bring to you the effect of the steam locos when they were in their heydays to show how they looked, how they worked, and for just one more time, perhaps live and outlive the glory of those days when the steam locos bore the brunt of Indian railways. Oh. Beauty contest remains very much valid today because perhaps this is the last time that we are going to be able to have uh, such a contest anywhere on the Indian railways. Perhaps in the rest of the world, like China and others, steam will continue. But on Indian railways, the pressures of economics have forced us to give up the lovable old monster of steam with this lovable 
sounds and uh, unique visual pleasure which uh, children loved and uh, therefore aspired to become locomotive uh, drivers when they grew up. It helps people to remember that the steam has served a glorious era from the old days if you look back into the past. There is intense competition amongst all those who have slaved on these uh, locomotives, these 10 competing locomotives, and therefore each one wants to win the prize. Therefore the judges are un uh, under intense scrutiny, perhaps more than the judges are in real life. And they have to therefore make it as scientific as possible. They have therefore div divided the system of grading into three distinct groups. One is decoration, for which they give 25% marks. The functionality, which is uh, we are giving as much as 50% uh, marks. And also the um, ceramic blanketing is being given a 25% marks. And uh, I think that the judges uh, will be totally fair and clear in their uh, judgment and we, the, may the best local win. What is important, when you see a when the whole thing should be uniformly red. The moment you see a black spot, there's a time where there's a hole and then the fire bars can burn. So when we are seeing the fire, you have to see that it looks uniformly red. That's it. There should be no black, localized black spots. Plus that thickness, the fire bed should be uniform. Those are things we have to look for. How is maintaining the fire? Very important. Everybody wants to win, and none more than Mr. Aurora a shed foreman who has worked in steam since he was 17. On board Romperhat's engine, he is never at a loss for words. Fully we could not do because we got it very late. So we have tried to put it at Explaining that even with all the hard work, they had just run out of time. Like all the engines, the judges take into account how efficiently she runs. They put her through the paces, while Aurora hangs on like a doting father. So bosses, my examiners, they have been very much pleased with the work with you boys, with my staff, with my driver and other fellows, you know, all the whole Rampura has done in decorating this locomotive, in making it fit mechanically sound. And they have checked all the points and I think we have got, if not 10%, then at least 90%. Now we should leave the result to Almighty God, you know, so Almighty God is there. They parade in all their glory, and anticipation runs high. Now it's up to the judges to reveal the last Black Beauty winner. Nandini of Asenso Shed will claim the prize. For Nandini and her crew, this is an occasion to remember. But they know, as they back her into the shed, that their victory is bittersweet. For despite the fact that the black beauties have proven themselves today, another fate awaits them.
In northeast India, a little toy train climbs the foothills of the Himalaya, the tallest mountains in the world. Every morning, Buddhist monks look towards the east, welcoming the sun to the remote mountain town of Darjeeling. Darjeeling has always been a frontier town, where an oriental look enters the faces of India. But it also tells of another heritage. The British loved the climate so much, they made it a hill station to escape the heat of the plains below. And the sounds of the train they brought echo up from the valleys. For the people of the mountain, the train has always been a part of their lives. In the days of the British Raj, it carried the famous Darjeeling tea down from the plantations. Eighteen little locomotives run back and forth on the Darjeeling Himalayan line. The youngest is 70 years old, and the oldest is 105. Every day, several trains climb from the plain of the Ganges in about the same amount of time it took Mark Twain when he came to Darjeeling in 1896. The beginning of every trip is a ritual for the six-man crew. Each engine is an antique heirloom that's been entrusted to their care and they look after them like living, breathing creatures, feeding and watering them. The fireman knows that only a good head of steam can carry the train up to 7,407 feet to reach the highest station in all of Asia. With two men riding on front, ready to throw sand on the rails for traction, and a coal breaker riding on top, the train finally sets out. Each engine has its own distinct personality, and no one understands his better than the driver, Mr. Guru. Like his father, he was assigned this same loco for life. And everyone along the way knows it's him by the sound of his whistle. For Shurab Tendif, one of many who have fought for its preservation, it's a reminder that some things do stay the same, and not to have it would be a great loss. When I was young, people really didn't travel that very much. Uh, the airplane hadn't arrived, and uh, the train was an important image for all of us, uh, an escape to the outer world, uh, a chance to see something over the mountains. Uh, you had this train which represents to us an opportunity for adventure. We used to jump on and off the train. Tickets weren't that important. 
There's a chugging, the sound of the movement of the train, uh, the energy of this train. It was like little Tibetan terrier. The obstacles that the British overcame in 1881 are still impressive even now. On the foothills of the Himalaya, they had little room to maneuver, and only by ingenious loops and switchbacks and the narrowest of tracks could the little toy train reach the top. If the train does not run, we do feel that there is something absent, and we do feel it very strongly. But as long as it is there, yes, it's a part of life. And uh, every day, if we don't see it, we see that something definitely is missing. India is a country of villages. More than 70% of its people live out their lives in a day-to-day -day existence where there is no hurry. And only the changing seasons mark the passage of time. This is where the railway is a lifeline bringing these remote areas in touch with the rest of the world. In South India, Palur is one of thousands of small way stations which haven't changed much since British colonial times. It is a single line track off the main route to Madras and only four trains a day stop here. Mr. Govinda Rajan is the station master. He took a demotion from a bigger station, choosing Palur to be near his sick wife and to live out his days in the peaceful quiet of the country. He shares his responsibilities with Kamakshi, a railway widow, who is officially the sweeper porter between the two of them, they run the entire station. Palur means milk village, and for the last hundred years, the villagers have relied on the milk train to carry their cans to the city markets. But before the train arrives, Govinda Rajan must coordinate with other stations to make sure that his line is clear for the coming train. It is a time-honored system in place since the days of the British. A bull token must be carried by the driver giving him the right of way on a single line track. At every station, he must pass the token and pick up another. Only then will he have permission to continue on his way. Now, I am asking line clear. This is the authority. 
Token C17. The line is officially open and Kamakshi can change the signals that will indicate to the driver that the track ahead is safe. She will pass the ball on to the driver and prepares the cane pouch. She is one of the few women working directly with the trains, but gained her job after a great loss. Her husband had been a fireman on a steam engine and committed suicide when he didn't make driver. It is the railway's custom to give a position to the widow and Kamakshi will have a job for life. As the train comes in, the ball token is handed over. Now the driver can move safely into the next section. Mr. Govindarajan has dedicated 33 years of his life to the railway and understands better than anyone how much these trains mean to rural India. But changes are coming and he has received word that with his retirement, his post will not be filled and Palur station will be closed. They tell him that with only a few trains a day, there just isn't enough profit. Soon, the trains won't be stopping here and people will have to take the roads. He will be the last station master of Palur. On Southern Railway, south of Madras, the Pondicherry Special makes her last journey. Nothing evokes the romance of the railway like a steam engine. Her arrival into Pondicherry Station is a grand event, and she will bring the platform to life for one last time. This is one of the few holdouts of steam. The locomotives were phased out of the big cities years ago, and now even small stations are seeing them vanish. But perhaps the greatest loss will be felt by those who have steam in their soul. And Don Dupani is one who feel it the most. A third generation railway man, he became what his father, a gatekeeper, always hoped he would be, a driver the pride of the line. Now he's been given the honor of taking the Pondicherry special on her final run. His engine may be old and worn down by age, 
But Don Dupani knows that what he is doing is something noble and historic. And he's always been proud of his duty. In India, the relationship between railway men has always been like family. The firemen, guards, cabin masters, and gatekeepers all have developed a deep bond through the years. Station masters on the single line tracks and the drivers of steam know that a time is coming to an end. Now the trading of the cane pouch marks the changing of the guard. Both Govindarajan and Don Dupani have since been retired. The Pondicherry special has been condemned. And Little Palur Station is now closed forever. Varanasi. Madurai, Bardaman. These are some of the sheds where generations of workers were born to serve the locomotive, with a craft held sacred. And where it was always believed that a father's knowledge would one day be handed down to his son. We'll be closing down this steam loco shed in a couple of months when the last of these black booties will have moved out. This shed had uh, something like uh, 71 locomotives a few years back. What we feel sad about the whole thing is that uh, something which fascinated uh, every railway uh, traveler over many, many years is dying out. What I feel personally sad about is that with the locomotive is dying out a breed of men who had nerves of steel. They were men of muscle, understood metal, what it was all about. What we get today in lieu is the diesels, the electrics, which have really no muscle in them. They're all technology, there is no sprit behind them. To us as old railwaymen, they are really uh, not comparables. This shed where the epitaph is now being written will see a gloomy picture in a few months from now and uh, will lose ever so slightly a part of our past something on which the railways all over the world have survived for the last hundred plus years. With that, uh, 
a lot of our soul will be gone. Every day, more and more black beauties are being pulled from the working lines. The iron beasts are now easy prey to scavengers who will take even their last bits of precious coal. The once busy sheds are becoming graveyards. For loco foreman, Mr. Aurora, Returning is like visiting old friends. See, this is the tragic part on my life. I was born and brought up in this with this steam locomotive. Now I feel as if I am left all alone and I am standing like a helpless man, can't do. But this is the demand from my nation. I feel as if a most loving member of my family is being cut into, cut into pieces in my presence, an old man looking, who is looking after the children and he is standing, he cannot do anything for his children at this dying, at their, this dying stage. Feel so bad. Really, I feel like weeping. I become helpless creature, but as I've told you, a day one has to die. Similarly, they have also to vanish one day or the other. All across India, steam sheds have turned into auction houses the locomotives await the highest bidder. They are the businessmen who have waited for the sheds to close before making their move. They buy the engines which are, to them, worth only their weight in scrap metal. Most of these men of steam will choose to stay with the railway. Some will have to be retrained, and others may have to relocate far from their homes. But for all, a way of life is over. There will be one survivor of steam, and by government ruling, it will remain. It is the Darjeeling Himalayan toy train, the oldest mountain railway in India. She is the symbol of the railway, and evokes the emotional and spiritual ties which the country has for its 
trains. The men who run her stand for the many who have devoted themselves to keeping the lifeline going. And for all those whose lives it touches, this will always be the Great Indian Railway. <laughs>